Good deal. All right, I'm uh, fired up tonight. Okay. <laughs> Uh -oh. I've already promised one congregant that the heat is coming tonight. We are talking about our future in the Lord. We're talking about the city of man and the city of God. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1 and join with me at verse 21. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21. Let's take a read here of what God has to say to us through the great prophet of old. Isaiah 1, and look with me here at verse 21. The faithful city, what an adulteress she has become. She was once full of justice, righteousness once dwelt in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your beer is diluted with water, your rulers are rebels and friends of thieves. They all love graft and chase after bribes. They do not defend the rights of the fatherless, and the widow's case never comes before them. Therefore the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, Ah, I will gain satisfaction against my foes. I will take revenge against my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and will burn away your dross completely. I will remove all your impurities and I will restore your judges so that they once, so what, what they once were and your advisors to their former state. Afterwards, you will be called the righteous city and the faithful city. Yeah. Let's pray. <laughs> God, forgive me and forgive us of how infatuated we sometimes become with this world and how anchored we become to it and how our minds often forget that this is all temporary, that this world will not last forever. For that matter, God, we know from your word and we know from your works of history that this nation will not last forever. That nothing is permanent whatsoever except for you and your word and your will. So we pray as we come into this word tonight that you would remind us continually of these great things and that you would turn our hearts away from the temporary and the fleeting and the worldly and to that great city in which you are breaking us into that we might dwell with you forever and see your face and glorify you with perfect minds and hearts and bodies and souls. We thank you, Lord, that you are mighty to destroy, and we thank you that you are mighty to save. And we just pray that you would lead and guide our hearts now in this word and build every saint by it. And if there is a soul here that needs to be ready for the coming of your return, that God, you would make them ready tonight by bringing them faith and repentance towards your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray all of these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. 410 years after the death and resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, the whole world trembled at the news that the mighty and powerful and ever-stretching Roman Empire had fallen to the hands of the Visigoths. It didn't seem possible that such a thing could happen, yet it did. And all of Rome proved that old saying that all kingdoms of earth fall, there are no exceptions. All of them fall. Nations greater than us have come. Nations greater than us have gone. A brother here asked me a couple of weeks ago what I thought that America's place was in the end of times. And when I read the Bible, uh, the only answer I had to give him was this. We join in with the harlot and we go to war against the land. That's what the nations will do. If you do not belong to Christ, if you are not his, if you are not of his kingdom, then that's what the nation's coming to. And we should take real good note that in the Bible, our particular civilization is not really a player at all, which is showing us that what we are now, we will not be then. So this, even this empire, is temporary and fleeting and possibly on the way out. Now when such kingdoms fall, men by nature want to find an answer, and as usual, man ascribed the fall of Rome to none other than those pesky Christians getting in the way of everything because they believed in this God, Jesus Christ, and they have forsaken the gods of Rome. That's why 
she fell. Had nothing to do with their moral decay, had nothing to do with their complete corruptness, none of that, of course. It was the Christian's fault for worshiping this God, Jesus. This left the Christians in a tough spot. They had to stay true to Christ in the face of ever-growing persecution against them. And it is here that one man, one theologian named Augustine of Hippo, rose up to comfort and encourage the people. And he did that by writing a book called The City of Man and The City of God. And he explained in that book that Christians are going to always find trouble in this world, this city of man, because we are not of the city of man. We are of the city of God. And he likened the city of man to the world of Cain and the city that we live in as being the world of Abel. Brothers and sisters, our city is not of this world. Our city is... The New Jerusalem, the city of God. The theologian of old was right. Jesus himself taught us if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Could you imagine hearing that in the first century? Could you imagine Jesus preaching that to you in the first century? Any takers for this Christian faith? <laughs> But then Jesus encouraged us saying, all of this I have told you so that you won't go astray. And he comforted us saying, these things I have spoken to you so that in me, Jesus says, in me, not in the world, in me, you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. The Christian's hope is not found Below in this fallen world, our hope is in Christ who transcends all the evil and pain that surrounds us. And in due time, he will bring his kingdom to earth where we shall forever dwell. And even before Christ, God wanted us to get this message. He wanted us to know this reality, which is the exact thing that we find in our scripture tonight. Our Lord takes us here through the city of man that we might see how fallen she really is. And then he takes us to the city of God, which shall come on that glorious day that our Lord Jesus returns. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, I tell you, there's not a man in this room more blessed than me. No way. There's not a man in this room that was raised amongst a great Christian family and had everything at his hands and fingertips. Nobody in here has ever lived as trouble and free of life as I have. And when I turn to Christ, I receive from him full forgiveness of my sins. I receive from him all blessings in the heavenly places. I have been given everything I need to overcome the evil one as he overcome all sin, Satan, and death, and hell. His victory is my victory. There is absolutely nobody on this planet that can say that they are as blessed as I am. But even I, I get tired of this place. <laughs> I get weary of this place. I thank God this is not eternity. And I look forward to the day. As that old song says, Beulah, y'all heard Beulah Land? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You got one? <coughs> Squire Parson, come on. Beulah Land, I'm longing for you. And someday on the I'll stand. Now tonight I'm preaching about that hope and the reality that our God is mighty to destroy the city of man and he is mighty to save the city of God. Now if you are quite at home in this world, this message is not going to touch you. I just want to prepare you for that up front. And if you really like this place, if you count it your home, if you love it, if you crave it, if you desire it, if you think of heaven and you're like, ah, oh, this feels kind of better, this will not be the message for you. This is not going to impact you at all. But if your heart beats for the coming world more than this one, then listen closely and you'll be strengthened and encouraged and comforted. So let's start tonight as we look first at the city of man. As pointing to Jerusalem, God says in verse 21, the faithful city, what an adulteress she has become. She was once full of justice, righteousness once dwelt in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your beer is diluted with water, your rulers are rebels, 
friends of thieves. They all love, graft, and chase after bribes. They do not defend the rights of the fatherless, and the widow's case never comes before them. As the Lord gazes upon his city and the people that bear his name in his city, he cannot do other than take note of how far she has fallen. He recalls to our minds the days in which faithfulness and righteousness and justice reign. He's talking here about the days of David, whose heart was true to God, the days of Solomon, who made silver as common as dust in that kingdom. But where there was once divine glory, now there is only decay. We see here that Israel went from adultery to adulteration. That is to say, they had stepped out on God. And because of that, the whole of their lives had been impacted not with power, not with glory, not with blessing, but with weakness and darkness and curse. Their glimmering silver had now turned to black and dull dross. Their expensive sparkling wine has now lost its sparkle and is as common as water. Note here, note here carefully, brothers and sisters, that in forsaking God, they forsook their lives. Brothers and sisters, we need to see clearly that so long as a people walks with God, they will walk in the light. And no matter if they live in the most material field society or a society without, they will walk in peace because all is right between them and their God through Christ. And that will pour over into the lives and society of those around them like it once did in Israel, but those days are now gone for Israel. Where this power and glory once resided, now it is just weakness, it is darkness, and it is corruption. Though men dwell in the earthly city of God, they are not of God. And for this reason, he warns, he warns in verse 24 that the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, I will gain satisfaction against my foes. I will take revenge against my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and will burn away your dross completely. I will remove your impurities. I will restore your judges to what they once were and your adversaries to their former state afterwards. Afterwards, you will be called the righteous city and a faithful city. God will not suffer himself to see the city identified by his name to continue on such a path. In his just wrath, his enemies will be destroyed, and his righteousness will once again flourish in the people and among the streets. Now we have to take careful observation here of the heart of the matter, because you and I live in a world that is just as fallen and just as corrupt as Jerusalem ever was the foremost lesson to learn here is that when god is lost in the hearts of men then all is lost even the best works of men become sin if they are not of christ count on you can do all the good you want to do you can give every manner of supply to every person around if you're not doing it for christ even that work is evil and yet here we live in this city of man. Here we labor and here we have to endure. We must constantly stand against the tides and the undercurrents of every antichrist ideal and belief. Folks, we have quite literally entered a period in time where men hate God so much that they, they actually believe that they can revolt against him by saying their genders have changed from the ones they are born with. You have to hate God on the depth unknown before to get to that point. Yeah. <clears throat> and it can never happen. It's all a delusion. And the great thing is, remember how those Christians at Rome uh, were blamed for the fall of Rome? Guess who's blamed for the problem now? It's preachers like Pastor Milam and First Baptist Winston. Man, if anybody gets a hold of this live stream, did you hear that bigoted talk when he said that you cannot change your gender from what you are born with and you're doing it only because you hate God? All of a sudden, I'm the problem. The truth of the matter is, we have the solution to the problem. 
That's right. We are not the problem. <laughs> Friends, where there is injustice, we must stand justly. Where there is godlessness, we must remain godly. Where there is sin, we must tell them of the Savior. For God takes note of the sons of men, and no deed is left blind to his eyes. And should we ever veer from the way, we can expect our Lord to discipline us as his people to hold on to the faith handed down once and for all to the saints. As Paul said in Corinthians, when we are judged, we Christians, when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. And it's good news because their condemnation is sure. Listen, brothers and sisters, the true pain in what we are reading here tonight is when, when God looks at this, he says, there was once justice, now there's murderers. There, there was once righteousness, now there's unrighteousness. And he, he talks then in terms of, I will satisfy my vengeance against these attacks against my holiness. He is not speaking here to a foreign nation. He is speaking here to his people, Israel. Note the connection, friend, between idolatry and injustice. Did you see that? He starts off saying, they are adulteresses. Why would he say that? Because they have stepped out on him and they have worshipped the gods of the Canaanites around them. That's the first sin, idolatry. And from that idolatry bleeds every matter of injustice. So learn something here, friend. See something here. If you ever see something just completely crazy going on in the world around us, something completely corrupt, something completely uncouth and unjust, this is why it's happening. When man will not honor his maker, there is nothing left for him but corruption. And there's nothing left for him because he decides to play God. As one commentator says, social injustice is ultimately refusal to submit oneself to a just and loving God. That's what's happening here. This is why we see man's inhumanity played out everywhere. Listen, I don't know the backstories. I don't know what was going on in El Paso. I don't know what was going on in Dayton. I don't know what's behind all of that, but at heart what I know is somebody was so torn from God and so apart from him and lived in such darkness that their lives bled over in evil to the lives of those around them. This is why it happens. You saw it there, didn't you? Righteousness once dwelt in her, but now murderers. Murderers. And of course, what's the problem? Again, again, Pastor Milam's the problem here. He's one of these gun toting Bible thumping preachers that probably has a stockpile at his house. That's of course false. Oh, my stockpile was lost in a boating accident. Everybody knows that. <laughs> but it's it's not a problem of the heart. It's the gun's problem. If it's not a gun problem, somebody was raised wrong, the mom and dad spanked them too much. So now all of a sudden all parents are off. Man, I tell you, when you depart from God, you depart big time. Yeah, that's right. And for Israel, this happened from the top down. Verse 23 says, your rulers are rebels and friends of thieves. They all love graft. I have no idea why my translation used that, graft. It just means they all love gifts. They love to get gifts so that they can give a, a favorable court opinion your way. They all love gifts and they chase after bribes. Nothing new there. They do not defend the rights of the fatherless and the widow's case never comes before them again. Nothing new there. Still have. They can gain nothing from the orphan or the widow so they give them no hearing and no justice. That's an amazing thing to consider that folks desire this city and desire this land. Even a lot of people that profess Christ are so infatuated with the city of man that they can hardly think of there being a better life or a better land than the one they're living in. Be careful, brothers and sisters. You ever find yourself at ease 
in the city of man. Do you ever find yourself comfortable in Babylon? For the city of man bleeds red with corruption and it's seen in every agent and every people and God takes note of it all and it will be brought to his judgment. Now, that's the city of man and it's a painful thing to live in but we, we see something a lot better here secondly tonight in the city of God. Look at what's written in verse 24. God says, therefore, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel declares, ah, oh, I will gain satisfaction against my foes. I will take revenge against my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and will burn away your dross completely. I will remove all your appearance. Was not expecting that after the first part of these, these verses. Isaiah is moved by the Spirit to make much of the name of God. He starts out saying that God is the Lord of hosts. He is the mighty one of Israel. And after you've read of all these crimes of Israel, and the prophet then says, He is the Lord of hosts. He is the mighty one of Israel. And it's like this humongous wave building. And Israel is a small ship right underneath. And you think the wave is about to crash down and bust them to pieces. But just when it looms large, just when, it, just when the scripture is reminded to us, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of God. We see something incredible happen. But before we really get into that, I want us to think here for a moment of the reality that God is mighty to destroy. God is mighty to destroy. My brothers and sisters, the citizens of the city of man are in a bad shape. If they are made to stand before God on their own, they are able to bring nothing of pleasure to him, nothing of peace to him. All they bring is their sins against him, and he is truly furious with them. He is outraged by them. I know, again, yeah. I have to my own Bible tell you, yeah, I get that, but... I want us to get real with something here. God is not at all pleased with the sinner. Not at all pleased. I know, I know we like to say, hey, hey man, God hates the sin and loves the sinner. But did you ever notice he sends the sinner to hell? Yeah. So I think he's got a problem <laughs> with those in the city of man. Yeah. I think he's got an issue with them. And that issue is they have brought before him assault after assault after assault on his holiness and they must pay for it eternally because he is an eternal God. Jonathan Edwards, great thinker of old and, and a great preacher, pastor of old, he said in one of his sermons that there is nothing that keeps wicked men at any moment out of hell except the mere pleasure of God. That's it. He is simply pleased not to send them there now. But if they do not turn to Christ, they will go there. And by his titles, we know that he could at any moment justly and righteously let go of the dam of his anger against them and gain, as he says, satisfaction against his what? His foes, those who have stood against him. But brothers and sisters, right when it seems, right when it seems that this dam is about to break loose, right when it seems that God is about to let that wave crash down upon them, something amazing happens here that we find that not only is God mighty to destroy, but God is also mighty to save. And he will save us through purification from our sins and sinful ways. He says, I will burn away your dross completely. Yeah. And I will remove your impurity. Do you know what dross is, right? Anybody here ever worked with lead? Everybody here seems to be in pretty good mental shape, so I'm guessing not. Well, I've worked with it. <laughs> and y'all are like, that explains a lot. Yeah. When you put your lead into the furnace, what happens is this black nastiness comes up. But lead in and of itself doesn't seem to harm you too much. I only have a slight tick with it. That's really no problem. But the black stuff that oxidized lead, that will get you. You've got to get that out of your space, 
out of your life completely. And God is saying that black nastiness that breathes like a cancer, that's what I burn away. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I burn it away. I remove your impurities. I will restore your judges to what they once were and your advisors to the former state and afterwards you will be called the righteous city, a faithful city. Now that's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of thing that gets me fired up both as a Christian and as a preacher. This is the realization of our hope. This is what happens when our faith becomes sight. What God has laid up in our future and the great return of our Lord Jesus and the bringing of his kingdom with him is what God is talking about here. This is that great rock that you read of in Daniel. You remember that rock? Daniel said, I saw this rock and it started tumbling down. And as it came down, it grew bigger and bigger and bigger until it smashed all of this statue, which was the kingdoms of men. And it just smashed that statue. And he said, and the rock, the rock just kept growing and growing and growing and growing until it took over the whole earth. What in the world was he talking about? What he was talking about was that rock is the kingdom of God. Man. It is the last, final, eternal kingdom. And it is coming. And it will take all of we who belong to Christ into it. There shall be a time when the people of earth will bow before Jesus as he is our bridegroom and he comes to take we his bride and it's going to be glorious. It's going to be absolutely glorious. Amen. The last conversation I had with Brother Charlie just a few days back, we were talking about this very thing and he said, he said, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that. Well, he's going to see it. Yeah. But he's going to say it from heaven, not from earth. And that's the great thing. It is Christ who will come to us and set everything right. It is he that will rescue us from the city of man and bring us into the city of God. This is what Peter said about this city. He said, according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The very thing we lack here. Righteousness. And certainly I pray that you look forward to that kingdom. I fear, my brothers and sisters, that this has been lost. So very many who are Christians, we tend to become too fascinated. We tend to become too enthralled with this world and its problems and the comforts we want in it that our hearts hang low instead of always being lifted up in hope. Let me tell you what the kingdom of God does. I'll never forget when my new uh, professor of New Testament, Robert Stein, taught this to me at Southern Seminary. He said that the kingdom of God does two things for us now. It, it helps us to glorify God in our victories as we realize that a taste of that kingdom is already working among us. And it also encourages us in our failures to know that the day is coming that we'll fail no more. Yeah. I dig that. I like that. To think, yes, I failed today. But the day is coming that for all of eternity I will fail no more. Because I will be made righteous. And God will put me in a land of righteousness where that will dwell forever. As he does. This is the day that we are going to see Jesus face to face. See God with our eyes. Moses wanted this so badly. Lord, just let me see. Let me see you. And that's enough. Remember the apostles? Hey, just show us the Father. Lord, just show us the Father. And that's enough for us. <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> Everybody has this desire. I, I hope to see God. And we're going to see him in that day. This is the day that we're going to be raised as he was raised. This will be the day that our hearts are completely perfected and never again shall we even desire sin or have to fight against it. This is the day that our minds will be made perfect and clarity of thought will echo within us as a crystal glassy sea around the throne of God. This is the day that our bodies will be perfected. No more cancer, no more disease, no more death ever. Ever, ever. 
heard a report when I was back home on the news. Because while I don't have cable, every last member of my family does. <laughs> they said that Kentucky leads the nation in teenage automobile deaths. Well, that has to be a hard wrenching yeah. thing. The day is coming. That's not going to happen anymore. We've had a taste of that here in the last year or so, haven't we? We've lost a couple of young people. I can't imagine the pain that throws upon their parents, but what I do know is that if they believe in Jesus Christ, the day is happening that that's going to go on no more. This is the day that we will lay down all our petty fights and differences and be united as one in Christ. Everything we want, everything we desire, everything we need shall be fully given to us in that great and glorious day that we enter the city of God. So let us see clearly the choice we make if we prefer the city of man to the city of God. The eternity made ready for those who refuse Jesus as their Lord and Savior is as deeply horrid as the gladness of believers. We are talking here of eternal separation from God, suffering eternally for your failure to honor Christ by giving him your heart of faith. We are talking the eternal burning flames, the gnashing teeth, a mighty gulf that always sees what could have been, but you chose otherwise. If you think faith in Jesus is a small thing to God, you better think again. It means everything to him, and it means everything to us. The city of man will only lead you to suffering and to death. It is the city of God that you shall find life right from the king himself. Now, believers, what should we do with this message? We should look forward to the city of God while we live in the city of man. Don't ever put your hopes that belong in the city of God here in the city of man. Because this place is going down. Yeah. And she's going down in flames. Think about it. Every last thing you see, everything you see is going to be burnt away. All that life investment, all the, the building up of monuments and memorials, burn the God. That a new heavens and new earth will come in. Don't we sing about this? Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. And thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching up to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly king, children of the heavenly king may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching onward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Friend, I don't know about you, but I know that by the grace of God given to me through Jesus Christ, my Lord, I am bound for the promised land. Amen. Won't you come and go with me? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this hope. Thank you for this hope that gives us such strength. Thank you for the great reminder that living in the city of man comes with every tribulation and problem that you said it would. That only in the city of God, your city, will we have peace and righteousness forever. Tune our hearts to always see that place. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters tonight that you would just build us and equip us all in this knowledge. And as we depart and leave from here, we would have these eyes that see by faith what shall be when you return? And we do pray, Lord Jesus, come to us quickly. May our hearts be ready for that day. May our lamps be filled with oil. May we, Lord, do your work here while we cast an eye and our hearts to the sky. We pray all of these things in your holy name and for your glory.